How the f*** do I work in class? This is like a child, this is like a primary school child wrote this. Okay, there's a clear class distinction with the, the Oasis situation, but let's have a look at, let's have a look at Simon Price's article. So Simon Price says, I mean, this is Simon Price. Now, I, like I said the other day, like I do not really like judging people on how they look, so I'm, I couldn't, I will definitely not have any comment to make about Simon, Simon Price. So he actually looks all right. He, has, he appears to have some kind of antennae, so maybe he's receiving and transmitting somewhere there. I don't know what's going on with that. Anyway, he says, stop the celebrations. Oasis are the most damaging pop cultural force in re recent British history. Dismal lyrics, plodding tunes and prehistoric political views. Why is everyone so happy that the Gallagher brothers are back? How long is the article just to see? It looks manageable. So 15 years of Punch and Judy bickering between Liam and Noel Gallagher has ended with the inevitable Oasis reforming for a UK and Ireland tour and a giant payday money talks, especially when Noel has a reported £20 million divorce settlement to cover. Ooh, there's a bit of gossip. Cue wild celebrations from the section of the British public who are still nostalgic for the simpler times of Euro 96 and the first Blair administration. Oh, f***ing what the section that just re-elected Tony Blair's bastard simulacra. Brit pops coming uh, home. What was it? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Danny and Withnail, didn't he? He was like, uh, your air is your antenna. <laughs> like that's, maybe that's what Simon Price has given it. I'm not among them. <laughs> and here's why. <laughs> I genuinely believe Oasis are the most damaging pop cultural force in recent British history. It's not that recently, it's like 30 years ago since they first popped up, is it though? Like, how, we're getting on, like, time is, time is moving. It's easy to attack them for being musically regressive. After all, they didn't just stop the clocks to quote the title of their 2006 best of, but rewound them by 30 years. But the real problem is that they set social attitudes back even further. Okay. I'll never forget being present at the Q Awards and this is just, oh, we know you never forget being present at the Q Awards because you probably f***ing tell everyone at every boring dinner party you ever f***ing go to like, you know? When Liam Gallagher repeatedly heckled Robbie Williams with queer <laughs> and Kylie Minogue with lesbian as the assembled music business and media tittered nervously, reluctant to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. <laughs> It's one of the ugliest scenes I've ever witnessed. This wasn't a one-off either. In 2016 on Twitter, he called Russian football hooligans batty boys. <laughs> and in 2018, used another homophobic slur, bum chums, against Noel, Johnny Marr and Paul Weller. I mean, like, I didn't realise that we'd reached utopia, you know, we've now got a genocide. And this is the problem, isn't it? This sense of this kind of moral purity. It's like, let's, let's, let's induce, let's have exponential social deprivation, harsher economic circumstances, absolutely destroy our public services, stick 60 kids in a school classroom whilst everybody else goes to private school and gets like home tutored and that, you know and quinoa for their breakfast. And then he wants to moan about ca casual homophobia stuff. You know, it's like, it's it's hardly, you know, is it pleasant? No, it's not pleasant, but is it that Christ almighty, you know what I mean? Noel too has repeatedly expressed prehistoric views, complaining about a hip hop artist, Jay-Z. Oh, this will be, this will be his white savior complex, like, you know what I mean? Because the hip hop guy's like black and that. Complaining about a hip hop Jay-Z headlining Glastonbury in 2008. I mean, f***ing hell, he's like, who gives a f*** about Glastonbury, like? What a f Though he'd softened his stance by the time Stormzy headlined in 2019. <laughs> it sounds like this guy's like got a total boner for Oasis. Like he seems to know everything about them. He seems to know everything they've said and done. This guy sounds a tool. <laughs> Clearly nostalgia. Oasis was the end of the Tories, not the start of Labour. Morning Glory was 95. 95. Labour didn't get in till uh, 97, great point. Stone Cold Facts from Arpignon. Uh, uh, Ed Miliband, yes, Ed Miliband is a f***ing communist. <laughs> 2015, and later Jeremy Corbyn in similar terms. 
And what is this like? Is this guy? This guy basically is obsessed with Oasis. It's projection, isn't it? Basically obsessed with them. In 2021, he appeared on the front page of The Sun <laughs> calling Prince Harry an effing woke snowflake. I think he should be hanged for these crimes, to be honest, like, you know? And in 2024, complained about Glastonbury being too woke. The more he writes this article, the more I, I might even try and get a ticket <laughs> to, go, to go and see The more I'm actually, I, I was never really that fussed about them, like, you know what I mean? But the, the more he writes, the more I like Oasis. Glastonbury being too woke. Hint, when anyone uses the word woke as an insult, they're immediately emblazoning another word across their own forehead, which also begins with W. Um, wide. It's no coincidence that Oasis are the band of choice for flag shaggers and reform voters. This guy is a astronomical penis, isn't he? This guy basically is a penis. It's remarkable how often their fans have the butcher's apron on their Twitter bios, oh, as opposed to their pronouns like, you know? <laughs> like, Christ almighty. Just as Noel had it painted on his kid's so This guy sounds like a fucking absolute walloper, eh? <laughs> Oasis apologists. <laughs> I never knew that. I never knew that being a fan of a band made you <laughs> like an apologist. <laughs> I think we... <laughs> I think we all hate that guy. So, so what's his name? Simon Price must have just decided. Like is it, Simon Price is in, indulging in it. In, sort of, you know, it's like they have that thing, death by cop, where someone just causes a scene so that the, the cops turn up and assass assassinate them. Like, I think there's something similar going on for Simon here. Death by Oasis. <laughs> it's, just, it's almost, you'd think it was satire. Oasis apologists in the media. Well, I'm not in the media, but I, and I didn't know I was an, an Oasis apologist. But I've essentially, I ha, I have essentially brushed over all of this stuff already. <laughs> Calm down, son. Oh, Simon, did some did somebody call you a bad name? That's a shame, Simon. Calling Noel a legend. Simon's a shit failed musician, isn't he? It's clear. Simon's a failed musician. He's, he made some f esoteric ambient. And sound music, like some sort of like noise core or something, and absolutely nobody gave a fuck about it, and that's why he's this is this is why he's taken to like just raging, <laughs> raging at these working class lads that that have made it made it big and have got more money than Simon could ever possibly imagine. Who gives good copy and chuckling at Liam's banter, <laughs> arguing that Oasis are the people's band or the voice of a generation. I don't think it's much of an argument. It's not really up for dispute, is it? Like, the fact of the matter is, right, most of the folk I know who absolutely love Oasis, they're all working class. And I don't think they're exclusively a working class band, but they're massively loved by working class folk, you know? It spits off that generation predominantly. And there's still young cats now. They love, they love Oasis. This, these people hate people having, enjoying themselves and that the Gallicers are expressing the views of the masses in the vernacular of the masses. When you dare to challenge that, you are invariably accused of snobbery. <laughs> no shit Sherlock. <laughs> Against a band who have been dubiously anointed as the sole authentic musical mouthpiece of the proletariat. No, what these people can't stand, they only want, they want to define the proletariat on their terms. You see, this because this is total vampire castle chat. This is bourgeois liberal, post-identitarian politics, well, identitarian politics expression of that. And it's like, they, they hate the working classes and the only time they ever want to have the working classes discussed is on their terms. They get to decide what the working classes are and aren't. And you'll see examples of this. I've got lo there's loads of examples of this of over the past few days. There's some guitar guy in Glasgow, somebody kept sending me his tweets, he's blocked me, but he's called them, um, I'd have to check, uh, Robert somebody. And he's another one that was going, um, disputing their disputing the fact that they're working class. Basically going like, oh, come on, they're not working, they're not actually, like, that's the vibe. It's like, how the f working class. Why they don't even want, they don't even want to, it's like they hate them, but they didn't they want to deny them they even they want to deny them their working class credentials if you like. What a, this has been a great 
cultural moment, really, to be honest. Let's be honest about this. When this is, these people are really exposing themselves now. They can feel their woke sort of castle just crumbling around about them. It's kind of like at the end of Journey to the Centre of the Earth, you know, when like the it all starts crumbling and they have to get out. It's like the temple starts falling down, you know. It was like Sinbad or something. One of these, one of these films. It's like that. It's all collapsing around about them, isn't it? Their their their, their pronoun fortresses are just tumbling at the ground. But the Gallicers can't outflank me on class. <laughs> Is that right, Simon? <laughs> We're getting into delusion territory now. At the risk of writing a Glamorgan version of the Four Yorkshiremen sketch, well, you're about to write it. It's not at the risk. There's no risk in. There's there's no risk in cult here. The basic facts of my upbringing are these. <laughs> How many aces have you got? Like you know, single parent family, permanently skint. Never, what a f wet wipe, eh? Never had a car. Never had a telephone. Never had a breakfast. Never had a dinner. The TV kept getting repossessed. And I lived in seven different flats and houses before I left home. Clearly, nobody wanted to live with you. I've seen Leafy Burnage and the house Liam and Noel grew up in. And we never lived anywhere as big as that. Jesus wept, eh? This, <laughs> this is this real? <laughs> Nor can they outflank me on age. I'm slightly younger than Noel, what? And guitarist Paul Bonehead Arthurs, a bit older than Liam. This is like a child, this is like a primary school child wrote this. This is, this is, well, are we surprised? It's the Guardian or the Granuad or whatever they call it. Like, I mean, it's, but it's, this is mental, eh? A bit older than Liam and the others. I'm from their class and their generation. But the inconvenient truth is that no class is a homogenous class and nor is my generation. So why have you, why have you attempted to kind of like, you know, suggest that it is in some ways by writing that? Oasis have been presented as the true voice of the council estates from the very start of their career. But what of their less stereotypical but equally working class 1990s contemporaries? Don't they count? No band was more aware of class politics than Sheffield's Pulp, for example. But Pulp were arty and sang about outsiderdom and dressed like Oxfam dandies instead of Arndale Centre Townies. So they're considered somehow less real than their Mancunian peers. This guy just hates them, doesn't he? This guy just can't stand them. I can't even be, but I don't know if I can continue, to be honest. I'm finding it is, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. Christ. So they are considered somehow less real than their Mancunian peers. Meanwhile, the Manic Street preachers are as working class as they come, but refuse to conform to lads, lads, lads cliches, played with androgyny and homoeroticism, and wore their state education on their leopard print sleeves. The Gallicers' knuckle-dragging ideas on sexuality and politics arguably shouldn't matter. Well, f because they didn't. Because <laughs> they f don't, right? Because it doesn't matter. We're all familiar with separating the art from the artist. Is that, are you? <laughs> really? <laughs> Though everyone's mileage varies on where to set the line in the sand. That's the first honest statement in his entire article. <laughs> but the art needs to at least be good. Oasis, memorably described by the late Neil Kulkarni as English Rock Defence League, offer nothing but sludgy, trudgy, brontosaurus bottomed waddle. Perfect for that adult nappy gate so beloved of their singer and fans. What a snooty bastard, eh? Lyrically too, they are dismal. Promisingly mischievous Elsa Alcala Seltzer rhyme of debut single Supersonic soon gave way to dull platitudes that might as well have been written by AI. But the problem is the music. Oasis don't do fast songs. No plays his guitar as if he's scared it will break. And Oasis' funkless, sexless plod is always carefully pitched below the velocity at which fluid dynamics dictate that you might spill your lager. Is there anything more useless than a rock band that doesn't rock? Hold on, funkless sexless plod. If I had to describe an image that made me think of funkless, funkless sexless plod, I don't think I could do better than that. Right, anyway, we got through that. <laughs> It was pretty painful. <laughs> it was pretty painful to say the least. 